Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, even though we took a week off, we're refreshed. We're ready to go. We have a great episode of Miami Vice. It's season four, episode 16, titled Honor Among Thieves? Question mark? Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know why there's a question mark in this. I don't know. The name is, doesn't make any sense. Why is it Thieves? No one's stealing anything. That's what I was going <laughs> to say. The the name doesn't seem to fit the episode. I, I see what they're going for, that it's honor among criminals because they're going to try this person yeah, but, who's a but make scumbag. It but. Criminals then. Like, why make it Thieves? No one steals anything. The the huh? Legion of Dumb would have been much better. <laughs> <laughs> this episode premiered on March 4th, 1988. It is written by Jack Richardson. This is his first episode. He's got two more coming. More importantly, based on what we've seen before, is the director is Jim Johnston, who also directed Nobody Lives Forever. But in a similar storyline, he also directed Out Where the Buses Don't Run. You know what's funny? This episode, the writer might not be the most accomplished writer in the episode or uh, involved in the episode. Actually, the guy that plays Paul Delgado, John Bowman, he was a writer for SNL from 84 to 94. He wrote for the sitcom Martin, 92 to 97. He also wrote for Cedric the Entertainer Presents, 2000 to 2003. He was also a writer in Living Color from 90 to 93. So Damn. he was also a producer. Produced the Hughley's Murphy Brown Frank TV, where he also wrote some episodes. Damn, so pretty much somewhere between like the early 80s and the mid 90s, you probably heard a lot of his comedy. The creepy guy in this episode? So, yeah, he wrote everything you thought was funny <laughs> in the 90s. All right, John, we got someone I've never heard of before. One band that you've talked about before. And then there's Aerosmith. Yeah, so let's get Sweet 16 by Billy Idol out of the way. This is his third appearance. He was also talked about in Down for the Count, Part 2, and The Rising Sun of Death. We have already mentioned on how he was almost T-1000 in Terminator. We've talked quite a bit about him. The song Sweet 16 was on the album Whiplash Smile in 1987. It was a hit. In fact, it got all the way down to number 12. On the Hot 100 on June 27th, 1987. So, Idol would actually only have two more top 40 singles in his career after this song, since he's no longer relevant. Goodbye, Billy Idol. <laughs> okay, next, let's talk about the song Capriccio Arabe Ar 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 by Francisco. Torrego, uh, a bitch. Sean, Francisco. <laughs> I look forward to every week where we have someone that's got a really complicated name because I love your <laughs> attempts at saying it. I don't know how to say it either, and I would be just as bad. Yes. But I love that you're backed into a corner and you have to. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> By Francisco Torrega. So he is a Spanish composer and classical guitarist. During the Romantic period, and to give you an idea, that's the late 1800s, early 1900s, as he passed, he died in 1909 at the age of 57. Damn! Why, how does his music end up in Miami Vice? Well, he is known for such classic pieces as Recuerdos de la Alhambra. And I mean, everyone knows... <laughs> Roquedos de la Alhambra. <laughs> okay, so reading his biography, I could tell you a lot of old-timey facts, but <laughs> what really caught my attention, Francisco's father was a musician. He used to play with his dad's guitar growing up, but he ran away when he was a little kid, and he fell into an irrigation ditch and injured his eyes. And so his parents, obviously, I mean, if your kid fell into an uh, irrigation dish and into his eyes. Wouldn't you put him in to music classes? Isn't that the <laughs> obvious answer? <laughs> well, it's not painting. <laughs> so his parents put him into music classes because if he was going to go blind, that they had seen other blind musicians succeed before. And this is, he's still pretty young because the second time he ran away, he was 10 years old. He was being tutored by Julian Arcus, who was a concert guitarist. And he would run away and try to make his own music career by playing uh, in coffee shops. 
His dad would find him, bring him home. And then about three years later, he would run away again. This time, he would go to Valencia and join a gang of gypsies. <laughs> Once again, he was found and returned home, only to run away and join... I, I cannot confirm if it was the same gang of gypsies or a different <laughs> gang of gypsies. How many <laughs> gangs of gypsies are there? I don't know. But but let's just say by the time he was... The, he was a little shit. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I don't know why they kept going after him. The fourth time, he would have been on his own. So he eventually returned home and then became very, very, very famous. Traveled all across Europe and then died... At 13 days after half his face went numb, um, if that's some kind of a coincidence. So, our last song is Ragdoll, Aerosmith. And everyone's heard of Aerosmith, right? <laughs> Often known as the boys from Boston. Are they really known as the bad boys from Boston? Are they? Are they from Boston? Might explain some things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bad boys, though? Like, what? Bad boys. Come on. They're made up Come of uh, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Tom Hamilton, Joey Kramer, and at one time, Ray Tabano. They were formed in 1970 and originally called the Jam Band. There were a few other names in there. So, but <laughs> in, in, in 1971, though, Tabano would be replaced by Brad Whitford, and they would never look back. Sorry, Tabano. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Uh, so in their in the beginning, uh, when they were called the Jam Band, they've said in interviews and biographies that they pretty much, uh, when they were practice, they would just get stoned and watch episodes of Three Stooges. <laughs> I like these guys. They were pretty much instant su successes, though. I mean, they formed in '70. They fired a guy by '71. They had the band formed and got a little bit of local acclaim about them. And by 1972, they were signed by Columbia Records. And which followed a string of gold and platinum records. Albums like Get Your Wings, 1974, or Toys in the Attic, 1975, or Rocks in 1976. I mean, gold album every year. Like, that's just crazy. Damn. By the end of the 70s, they were touring. They had a dozen Hot 100 singles, which is one of the most popular bands of the decade. But like most things, spring and partying and eventual drug addiction took its toll. Tyler even actually once claimed that he spent up to $64 million on drugs during his, <laughs> his drug addiction, which Perry quickly stated as being completely false and, and, and utter bullshit. <laughs> and shut up. Not that there's any animosity between uh, Joe Perry and Steven Tyler. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go to this so, video clip of Steven Tyler falling off a stage. And see what Joe Perry has to say yes. about that. <laughs> what I love about the, uh, the biography I read was that things would get so bad that Joe Perry and Brad Whitford would leave the band in 1979 and then in 80. And they would leave the band until 1984. And the story in which why they left the band was Joe Perry's wife threw a glass of milk on someone else's wife. And according to Steven Tyler, he fired Joe Perry. <laughs> They would replace Perry and Whitfield, and they actually, the band struggled until 1984 when they struck a new deal with Geffen, which helped bring Perry and Whitford back to the band. 1986, they were still trying to make a comeback and still trying to get back to the popularity they once knew when they would do a mashup with Run DMC had just sampled their song, Walk This Way. That mashup, it, not only being one of the most famous rock and rap mergers in music history, pretty much was their comeback. I mean, it pretty much saved their career and brought them back to the level of popularity they were before. And what followed was the magic of Aerosmith in the late 80s and early 90s with albums like Pump, The Grip, and Nine Lives. We would meet a young Liv Tyler and her friend, Alicia Silverstone, whose career would be spurred in music videos that I grew up watching. <laughs> yeah, I remember her jumping off that bridge, but actually having a rope tied around her waist. So all in all, by the time they, get, uh, they got to the 2000s, they released three more albums in 2001, 2004, and 2012. They started, they appeared in TV shows, all kinds of different stuff. Hell, I want to even, I, I want to say there's even a Scooby-Doo meets Aerosmith something, <laughs> somewhere. The Simpsons. 
Blame it most. Yeah, yeah. Aside from TV and movie appearances, they've played the Super Bowl. And after 48 years of performing, they have sold over 150 million records. They have 25 gold albums, 18 platinum albums, 12 multi-platinum albums. His daughter, Liv Tyler, is a successful actress in her own right. Their soundtrack is the only good thing about Armageddon the movie. So, <laughs> um, so sorry, Puck Buck. You and Ben Affleck just didn't do it. <laughs> Insanely successful. And I will tell you, I could have gotten a lot more in-depth about Aerosmith. They're, they're one of those bands where it's like memoirs are, are like 500 pages and like every chapter is a, a different story about something crazy that happened yeah. on tour, you know, and, and from 1970 until about 84, because I want to say that the reason Perry and Whitfield joined again was because they, they agreed to get clean. Those stories are obviously the best stories. And then from 84 on, you get a whole lot of sober stories so you get stories about you know the guys with their families paint you know and <laughs> steven tyler letting his daughter paint his nails you know the atmosphere changes most recently steven tyler is doing one of those america's got talent or american idol shows i mean i'm always so mixed on aerosmith i am let me preface this with saying i am not an aerosmith fan at all like i don't really enjoy their music but i respect their place in rock history and their how how successful they've been in their era of rock and how many different decades their career span and how in pop culture centered that they've been even as they were banned in the 70s but you can keep your aerosmith <laughs> 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 Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I'm really interested to see where everyone else lands. I've kind of hinted at my standing <laughs> Not up so and subtly. <laughs> my opinion about this episode. Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. You know, we had a great week off. We're happy to be back. And we're getting so, so close to the end of season four. This was episode 16. We only have five more episodes to go until the end of the season so email us go with the heat at gmail.com we'd love to hear your favorite moments and your favorite episodes so far season four we're obviously going to take some time off at the end of the season take a couple weeks to get refreshed and go into the final season of miami vice so we would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what have been your favorite moments and your favorite episodes of this season so far. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe. You can find all the ways to get a hold of us. You can find all the ways to support us. Support level number one, contact us. Support number two, leave a review of the podcast on your podcatcher platform of choice. Go ahead and give it the highest rating of all. Just whatever it is, four pies, six tomatoes, like whatever the highest rating it is, go ahead and give that to us. But don't leave a review. No one ever reads the reviews. So instead, put in there how Palmo and Castillo know each other. We want your fan <laughs> fiction on how Palmo and Castillo know each other. And if you can, weave in the Speedo. Just weave it in the story somehow. The last way to support us, if you happen to have a nickel, a dime, a dollar available, we would be happy to take your support if you go over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Show us your support. Show us that you want to invest in the Go With The Heat podcast as we continue on this podcast and after Miami Vice is done. So we'd love to see your support. Whatever it is, a nickel, a dime. If you give us a dollar, I guarantee I will share a nickel with John. I guarantee it. <laughs> he'll, get a, he'll get an entire nickel. And if you want, if you want to make sure John I'll, gets I'll that just... nickel, mail us that nickel. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.